All right, take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 4. This is one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible, and maybe you're very familiar with it too. It's a very long passage, and so I'm not going to read every bit of it because you're very familiar with it. But uh, it, it, um, it's a story, again, that you've heard quite often. So I'm going to begin in chapter 4, verse 1. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees has, had heard that Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who were baptizing, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was around noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Now his disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well, and with his sons and his flock drank from it? And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink out of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. The woman said to him, sir, I see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you say the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here where the worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who must who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And then she said, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then the disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want or why are you speaking with her? The woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. Could he not be the Messiah? And they left the city and were on their way to him. Long passage today, but uh, there's usually only... One reason you go out of your way for most people, and that's because you got lost. <laughs> uh, I, this great story, when I was, uh, <clears throat> the biggest church I ever served was about 400 people. I was a congregational care pastor, and that meant I did a lot of visits to, to hospitals and to folks who were homebound. And uh, we brought on staff a nearly retired pastor who had worked with who had a great ministry with like homeless folks and folks in special need. And uh, this guy had a previous career as a very successful accountant. Uh, And that doesn't sound huge, but he had a very successful business. And uh, his name was Charlie, actually. Uh, And he had great stories about growing up in New York and Boston in an Italian family that uh, according to him, some of his family members had certain connections that he couldn't talk about very much, and uh, uh, and, and I believed him because he was this big, you know, Italian guy who looked like straight out of the movies. But anyway, we brought him on because he was so good with folks. It didn't matter how rough the folks were, and in that particular area right outside of Portland, Oregon, there were some rough characters at times, and. Charlie could handle them, man. It didn't, didn't matter. And he would help them. He'd find ways to help them, but he was very blunt and direct with them. But he was a kind, very talkative guy, and I'm a very talkative guy. 
and sometimes he and I would go on uh, uh, care visits together, which was fun for me because we both liked to talk and he had great stories. And uh, uh, anyway, it, it was only my third assignment ever in ministry, so that was kind of fun for me to hear his experiences. And so uh, uh, he's deceased now, God rest him, but a great guy. So we got in my car. We were gonna. We we were in. Uh, it's called Oregon City, Oregon. It's where both my boys were born, in fact. And um, this was a long, not a while back. Cause they're grown now. But uh, uh, so I uh, on the we get on the highway to go into Portland. Portland is the big city nearby. Oregon City was a suburb of, of Portland, and uh, uh, was about maybe a twenty-five minute drive. 30 minute drive, like about from here to Kansas City, into the city. And it was a big hospital, and it was one of the few hospitals. I, I made the rounds a lot of hospitals there in the suburbs and the cities and in the small towns, and it was the one hospital I hadn't been to. And I assumed that he had. <laughs> and so uh, got on the road into Portland, which I made that drive a lot, and uh, we started talking about all kinds of stuff. And again, he started launching into amazing stories of his youth and uh, of things that he had encountered, and even people he had encountered in our church or in our community. And I started talking about, because previous to that, I had pastored uh, just not far from there, and I was talking about that. And uh, we're driving, and we're driving, and we're driving down the freeway into the city. And all the while... He's assuming I know which exit to take. And I'm assuming he knows which exit to take. <laughs> and after a while, we knew it was about a half hour, so we're talking. And, uh, a half hour passed, and we kept talking. We kept driving down the freeway. And he finally stopped and looked at me and goes, do you know where we're going? And I said, you know, it's at the big hospital downtown. I, I just hadn't been to that one. He goes, well, I haven't either. And just then, I looked up and I saw a sign that said, Welcome to Washington. <laughs> we had driven all the way into another state. Uh, so thankfully, we did have a cell phone. I didn't have a GPS on. I, I don't know if I had one. I, I don't even know if I had a GPS at the time, but I know I had just one of those very basic cell phones. And so I, I called the office. And the secretary, very sweet you know, lady who knew us both, and uh, uh, I, I tried not to tell her we were lost, but that didn't work because after two sentences, she said, are you and Charlie lost? Have you been talking? I said, yes. She goes, where are you? She, tell me what sign. Yes, you knew the area really well. Tell me what signs you're seeing, Pastor, so that I can get you back. And I said... Well, I just saw this sign that said, Welcome to Washington. <laughs> she goes, Well, you're, uh, she started laughing, obviously. She goes, Yeah, you're way off. <laughs> you're not even close. Turn around the next chance you get. And, you got, you know, and then she kind of guided us and we did the visit and all that stuff. I, I, I like that story because um, it, it, uh, it reminds, I, I was with a guy who I feel like spent his whole life in ministry kind of going out of the way to bless others, going out of his way intentionally in ways he didn't have to. In fact, uh, when we brought him on staff, I was part of the decision-making process that brought him on staff there at that church, and I, uh, I asked him about, even financially, and he said, well, I don't, I don't need any pay at this stage. I'm, I'm fine. And I, I, uh, I thought, well, why don't, you know, you're about to work with some of the toughest people in the Portland area. Uh, and he just said, well, at this stage, I just, this is what God wants me to do. And uh, so I'm just going to do this. Um, so he spent his life going out of the way on purpose uh, to help people and to bless people. And, and I was hopefully learning that in my own ministry to kind of go out of your way and go that extra mile and spend that extra time. But th that funny moment where we really did go out of our way and ended up in a whole other state, it was because we were lost. Here's the difference. Jesus um, 
went out of his way on purpose to find people who were lost. I thought that was an irony there here in John 4. He went out of his way not because he was lost, but because someone who nobody else would care for was lost. And he sought them out. He sits by the well in the middle of the day where nobody comes and gets water in the desert in the middle of the day. Uh, well, somebody does. But it's people who don't fit in with the other folks who come and get water early in the day. They're people who either are outcasts and aren't welcome around polite society, or they just simply don't want the headache anymore of people giving them the stares. You know what I mean? Looking at them in some uh, bad way. Whispering about them behind their back, which this woman, I'm sure, got a lot of whispers. And she just was tired of that. So she got water when nobody else was there. There wasn't much water left, but she didn't need much. So she goes in the middle of the day. And guess who's waiting for her when nobody else is around? Jesus. This one who kind of went out of his way. Most good Jewish, especially good Jewish teachers, didn't, you know, the story didn't go through Samaria. It was the bad part of the area, especially between Samaritans and, Samaritans and Jews. Their rivalry goes back at this stage about 700 years. 700 years of tension between Samaritans and Jews over which people are the real Jews. Uh, and the Samaritans were in the, in the minority, and they were not seen. They were, they were seen almost like Gentiles, which was bad <laughs> back then. They were unclean. They didn't share things together. They were seen as unclean, as almost like traitors to their country. And uh, uh, so not only was it just inappropriate to even walk through that part of Samaria, which Jesus was doing on purpose. In fact, you know the story. It was very common to go around five or six or seven miles around, which to us doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're walking... Right, going six or seven miles out of the way was customary for good Jewish folks in order to avoid Sikar and Samaria, that whole area. And yet Jesus just goes right through. And not only does he do that, he sends his disciples off to get food and he waits by the well. And here to the well, when Jesus goes kind of out of his way, ironically, to be in this place that is considered not a good place for good, decent people to be, especially this time of the day, he encounters a woman, a Samaritan woman. Uh, it's like Jesus is going out of his way to almost stir up some trouble. Representative John Lewis, who marched with Dr. King, who died just recently, uh, used to call that the good kind of trouble. I like that phrase a lot. It's one of my favorite phrases, the good kind of trouble. Jesus goes out of his way to uh, encounter her with a good kind of trouble. But a good kind of trouble is this. Their thing, good kind of trouble means that the things that are easy to avoid because they're uncomfortable, yet they need your presence, you go there. That's the good kind of trouble. Things that are easy to just dismiss because the rest of the crowd dismisses them and yet you encounter them in grace and love and truth that's the good kind of trouble we all know how to get into the bad kind of trouble <laughs> but Jesus finds ways to kind of get into the good kind of trouble by intentionally going out of his way to share compassion so a couple things from this story and there's a lot you can say about this story I know but the first is we're called to follow Christ into this good kind of trouble, to go out of our way. That's what the church actually does best. And I don't mean in the meddlesome, like, uh, gossipy, mean-spirited kind of way, because that's not how Jesus steered this conversation. That's what the woman was afraid of, right? She was concerned that, oh, no, here's this Jewish guy. He's going to hate me to start with because I'm a Samaritan. And honestly, in a very patriarchal culture, because she's a woman. And secondly, 
or thirdly, uh, there's a reason, again, that people come to the well in the middle of the day. And he's no dummy, probably. I mean, we know he's not, but Jesus thinking, he's no dummy. He's going to know something is up here. Something is weird. And uh, so there's three strikes against her already, right? <laughs> and yet, and her fear is that the kind of trouble he's going to bring is this meddlesome, condemning, gossipy. And she even reminds him sort of preemptively, like, why are you asking me for water? Remember? She's kind of defensive about that. Like, you're a good Jewish man, I'm sure. I'm a Samaritan woman. You don't want any part of me. Right? So just drop it. Just, just let's not talk about this. You go on about your business, and I'll go on about mine. And yet Jesus intentionally confronts her with compassion. Um, so that's the first thing I learned. In fact, if we're going to follow Jesus, then we are called to intentionally move toward compassion, to go out of our way, so to speak, to share the love and grace and compassion that Jesus shares. Now, this is important. Now, just because everyone else avoids someone or a group or a, uh, a, a need in our world, it, it necessitates almost that we as Christians take up that mantle, move into that neighborhood, you know, confront that need or that group that needs a voice or that needs compassion, to do it in love. Uh, just because others like to play us versus them doesn't mean we as the church do that, right? Just because others like to dismiss certain people or groups, that doesn't mean we as the church get off the hook, right? We actually are on the hook for that. Just because people go out of their way to avoid someone in need, because that's kind of the way things happen in our world, sadly, right? Too often. Actually means that we as Christians are called to go out of our way to encounter them in love and grace. Isn't that funny? Isn't that interesting how the opposite is, is our calling? Jesus not only teaches that over and over again, in John 4, he demonstrates that up close and personal. Uh, it's the middle of the day, and she's getting water. She's alone. She's away from the crowd. There are men that we learn from Jesus who have taken advantage of her. Nothing is to be gained by loving and caring for her. But Jesus does it. Because to him... The goal is love. And for us, loving like Jesus is the goal. Looking like Jesus is the result and the goal. If it's important to him, it's important to us. And what's important to him is to go out of our way to find that overlooked, lost, sad, lonely, taken advantage of, not listened to person or persons, and love them, right, and love them. It amazes me, even in church life, and, and I've been in church life my whole life, like most of you have, probably all of you have, um, it amazes me how even in church life sometimes just reaching out and loving people can be uh, offensive and irritating and bothersome. To others. I'm not talking about agreeing with everybody and agree with everything she's done. I'm talking about reaching out in love and compassion and offering her the water of life as he's done. I mean, that sounds like the right thing to do. It sounds like a loving act. And yet, when we do that as Christians sometimes, right? I've got buddies. I've got a good buddy who got in trouble for that. And he didn't do anything wrong. He got in a little trouble. It was a good kind of trouble. But it was a little trouble because he reached out in compassion and love to a group in his community that wasn't being loved. And, and he got a lot of heat. And he just went, hey, I'm not agreeing with everybody, but I'm going to love these people. So you might as well get used to it. He was kind of a tough guy. And, uh, <laughs> and he did. Look, uh, Jesus not only didn't risk some credential, but Jesus risked his reputation maybe even his life in that community by doing this. And it didn't bother him. And in fact, when she tried to protect him, did you see that? She's trying to protect Jesus' reputation. 
She knows her reputation, and Jesus does too, we find out. But she's like, hey, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. Hey, uh, let's talk about theology and get off this topic of life. You know what I mean? Like, uh, what's your mountain? You know, remember, remember Jesus, is after she's saying, uh, as if she's saying, hey, you Jews worship over there, we worship over here. Remember? And she just keeps reminding him of, like, you shouldn't be around me. You shouldn't be around me. You shouldn't be helping me. This is not good for you. She is protecting him. And Jesus just breaks right through those. He's not being mean to her or out debating her. He's saying, you don't have to protect me. Uh, this is who I am. This is what I bring to you and to the world. The living water, the love of God, the salvation that comes from becoming a transformed follower of God through Christ. That's what I'm bringing. And I'll keep bringing it. No matter what you're, right? And finally she goes, well, let's just wait for the Messiah. I mean, let's just, let's just table this conversation, right? Let's put a bookmark here. And when the Messiah comes and explains all this, then, and then finally he just goes, hey, the one you're talking to right now, that's the one. That's who you've been waiting for. And immediately it says, she drops her water bucket. But that's the whole reason she spent time there, right? That's why she's there. She just says, forget the water, and runs back into town and begins to proclaim something good out of her life because Jesus has brought it. And I'll get to that in a second. But the first thing is you and I are called to move with compassion as Jesus did. It is a little scary when we reach out in love to someone who's hurting when we reach out in love to someone who is afraid, when we reach out in love to someone who disagrees with us, or who is harsh with us, or who's harsh with everybody. You got people like that in your life? I, I know people who are just, they're just prickly people. They're <laughs> just difficult. Uh, oh, you know, I, mean, I want to just shake them. I don't do that. That's assault, so I won't do that. But, um, uh, but you want to, kind of. You want to. And they're just prickly and difficult and, and and, and Jesus keeps just, right? He'll sometimes just keep going, yeah, but I, the reason you're there, the reason you're in that prickly person's life, uh, you know, you don't have to just take abuse all the time. I'm not saying that. Don't do that. But you're there to love. You're there to extend my love to them in ways that can change their life intentionally, sometimes going out of your way. I think the most memorable things that have been a part of the ministry that Ben and I have had, and even now, are, are times when not a lot of people knew about it, you know? I mean, we do, we all do things that people know about and, you know, see, and that's nice. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think the, the, the things we talk about and treasure, maybe the most, are things that are just those little unseen Right, little moments. They usually happen at like a nursing home or, <laughs> you know, a funeral parlor or, uh, you know, just, just an, a grocery store, an out-of-the-way place. You know, I've, I've joked with you, and it's not really a joke because I always end up picking the longest line. And I've told you the story just times in, in line in, where I end up getting the longest line and complaining to God about... No matter how many people are in the line, I pick the one that takes the longest. It doesn't matter. I've stopped caring. <laughs> I've stopped trying to do the math. I just get in line because it doesn't matter. I, and I tell people who come behind me, are you sure? Because <laughs> if I'm in this line, chances are you're going to be waiting. I'm just saying, you're, you're welcome to wait. But we're going to wait because that's just my spiritual gift, I guess, is just getting the longest line. But, you know, even some of those moments where God has uh, shown up in some weird way. I mean, uh, I've told you, you know, once I, you got, I've gotten to pray with people in, in grocery store lines uh, unexpectedly and not planned. Believe me, I want to get out of there, especially these days because I'm on, I mean, you know, it's not so vain, but I'm, I'm on TV. Oh, my gosh. Walmart lines are crazy for me. I, and they really are. And when my wife sits me all Walmart, I'm like, are you sure you want me to go right now? Because it's going to take a while. And she's like, Charles, what do you think? 
I'm not saying I'm famous here, but <laughs> but people in Walmart know me is what I'm saying. If I show up in Walmart, we're going to talk to some people. I, I mean, it's just going to happen. And, and that's fine with me, by the way. I love, I'm so humbled by that. I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed by it sometimes. It's like I, I've had people across Walmart call me by name. Strangers. Hey, Charles. Charles. Hey, come here. I'm looking around like, please let there be another Charles here. Please let it be her brother or her son or something. And I kind of amble over with my cart. Yes, ma'am. How can I help you? You okay? Everything good? I knew it was you. I knew. You're the news guy. You're not dressed like you usually do, but I knew it was you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Hey, I watch you on the news. Great. Thanks. I'm going to go get the milk now. Anyway, so, and I'm not, you know, I'm not me. I'm thankful. It's very sweet. But, um, but I'm going to get in the longest line, no matter what. And even in those times where I just want to get out of there, I just want to go, uh, Jesus will get our attention, won't he? And, and just remind us, hey, uh, I got something for you. There's somebody who I need you to talk to. There's somebody I need to listen to. There might be someone I need you to pray with. There might be someone I need you to spend extra time with. Nobody else is going to know it, but I'll know it. This is Jesus. Nobody else was around at the time, but isn't this woman glad that Jesus took that extra time? Changed her life forever. So that's the first thing. <clears throat> Final thing is this, and we've got to go, I know. Not only does he call us to intentionally move toward compassion, but he calls us to <clears throat> not be afraid of... Uh, of opposing voices when we're doing the right thing for Jesus. Even his disciples thought it was weird. You, you get it when they came back from getting from the grocery store, no, from getting food or whatever they're doing. When they came back, uh, they were even offended by me. <laughs> hey, hey, don't you? What, what is he doing? Like that's that's uncouth. That doesn't look right. That that's not good for his reputation. What is he doing talking to that woman? And Lord knows, there's only one reason why that one's collecting water in the middle of the day. You know what I mean? That's the conversation the 12 are having. And Jesus just says, guys, cut it. I mean, this is not, you don't understand me if you don't understand why I'm doing this. Contrast that to the woman's response. Drops her water, runs into town. And now look, this is the weirdest evangelistic altar call you've ever heard. You ready? Here it comes. Here, here it is. Here's the woman who runs into town loudly and says, come and meet this man who told me everything about myself. Now, I don't know if that's the best thing I've ever, you know, what? Uh, uh, it got people's attention, believe me. Um, here's what she meant, by the way. You know this. Here's what she meant. And I read a commentator who said this. I really love this. I think I read it years ago, and I still think it's true. Uh, here's what she meant. Come and meet this guy who knows everything about me, but loves me anyway. Isn't that what he meant? Come and meet this guy who knows everything about me, knows all my stuff, all my secrets, all the things that you guys, you know, shy away from me about. You guys are afraid of. You won't hang around me because of it. He knows all of that, and he loved me anyway. Could he be the Messiah? Well, yeah. <laughs> only, only the, only God's own Son, who comes in love and mercy, can love like that. And guess what? Because we follow Him, we can do that too. And that can be the message. And I didn't read that part, but if you read a little further down later on, or something like that, in verse thirty-nine, many Samaritans from that city believed in Jesus because of that woman's testimony. Verse thirty-nine. How about that? That's the result. When we intentionally go out of the way in compassion and love, when we hear the voice of those who, like her, had been abused and neglected and sometimes had also brought upon herself some stuff, those who the rest of society even just said, forget her, let her get her water. You know what I mean? She's not important. When we go out of our way and say, God loves you, and God has a place for you, and you know, you may... She herself was so embarrassed and filled with shame that she tried to deflect it. 
And, and I was going to say, can you imagine what that's like? Well, we know people. I mean, look, I, the more I hang around people, especially in church life, I think the number one reason, I used to think that people rejected Jesus because they're just, you know, angry or <laughs> whatever. Or they've met bad church people or whatever. And some of that is true. But let me tell you, I think the number one reason that people reject Jesus is shame. They're ashamed. They think there's no way God could love me. I think that's the number one reason. I think that was her reason. Jesus, just get away from me. Not because she hates Jesus. She didn't hate Jesus. She didn't know Jesus. She was ashamed. And Jesus, in love and mercy, cuts through that veil of shame. He says, hey, I know who you are. I know exactly. But I love you. And that became her testimony. That became her message, and she became really, if you're honest, if we're honest, she became one of the first missionaries in the history of the church. How about that? That messed up woman that nobody wanted to have anything to do with, five husbands or four husbands or whatever she had, a bunch of husbands. I mean, that woman became one of the first missionaries in the history of the church. Isn't that crazy? That's how the love of Christ can cut through and bring about his work. So, the results... Come, meet this man who knows everything about me and knows me and knows me and loves me anyway. Are we willing to risk in order to do that? Are we really willing to be an extension of that? Uh, Jesus would not stop until she knew that she was loved. It's hard. It's difficult, especially with difficult people, unloving people, sometimes shame-filled people who push us away. But Jesus works in us and through us and leads the way so that we can be an extension of that love.